Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hudson just wanted to get that on the recording. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have enough microphones out there? I guess we do. Everybody, make sure your microphones are on. I put new batteries in them this morning. So, oh, where did we leave off? You know, we were talking about you know the Mormons' view of who who is God, and I think that we pointed out enough. That I want to see that they have the wrong God. I mean, I I, I can't put it any nicer than you know have any nicer than that. I know that they would strongly disagree. But remember, we talked about their God doesn't come from eternity. Their God hasn't been God from you know from from eternity. God's not the their God is not the creator of all things. Because he was a created man himself at one time who worked his way up, you know, the exaltation ladder and became his, you know, became a god himself. Hang on, hang on just a second. Let me just finish the thought. Became, became his own god with his own planet, henceforth us, you know, and um, and we are children of that that god that once man who is now god okay ray and then uh, lol hang on the who created god well everybody everybody asks that everybody can ask that question and, and the reason that it doesn't it doesn't really work because you have this um infinite regression that you always, we even have to do that i mean we say that God is the uncaused creator. You know, that our God was uncaused, and we're right. He, he was uncaused. He just, you know, like that. Whereas they would have to go back and back and back, you know. You know, the atheists have the same problem because they say, well, there's no God. And then you say, well, you know, you're saying that the universe created you, which they would have to say. They would have to say, yeah, you know, the universe created me. And then you go, well, who created the universe? You know, and then they come up with the crazy, you know, things. Have you ever heard of the multiverse? You know, the multiverse is that there's a whole bunch of the universe, and our universe came out of all those other universes. And they say, you know, the universe, the universes are like, the foam of the you know of a wave that comes in and it makes that foam and it has all those bubbles, you know, and they go, well, all those bubbles are all these universes, and our universe was one of. See, this is the same kind of stuff that people have to do. Otherwise, you have this infinite regression of when do you know that you're ever at a beginning a beginning point? So the way that we say it is that everything. Everything that has a cause has a beginning. Okay, everything that has a cause has a beginning. Our God is the uncaused cause. Yes, yeah, so we just go back that far. But anyway, I, you know, to to answer your question, I really can't go beyond that because I don't know if they have a special thing that they say. Um, they see again. We have problems because we try to avoid polytheism. We try to avoid that there's multiple gods in the world. They have no problem with it. Yeah, okay. We'll get into that next, but I mean, they have no problem with that there's more than one god. It's just not, you know, part of. You know, well, that kind of falls in with with what's going on now with AI and also with the Pantheorian theory. That we basically man on Earth evolved from a from a spore that was delivered from Mars onto the Earth, and that's how we evolved. You know, Van Heineken's thing was, um, and Heineken's not the beer, but Van Heineken's thing was that um, aliens came to Earth, had a picnic, left their garbage here, and we formed out of the. Well, no, you know, you start out with a single cell from the, you know, from the garbage and, you know, and stuff like that. And then, and hence, henceforth, here we are. Okay. So, but again, see here, now here's the thing. 
This is why we have to know our Bible. We don't have to know their Bible because they're going to tell us if we run into if we run into uh, Mormons, they're going to tell us what their Bible says. Well, so we don't need to know their Bible. What we need to know is know our Bible, and that's what I've been trying to do here is make sure that on these topics, when it says there's one God, we've got a whole bunch of verses there on page three, I think it is, wherever it is, that for okay, that says what our Bible says. So when they come and they say, because we're going to talk a little bit about the preexistence, okay, <clears throat> and so they're going to say, yeah, you know, and so this was our heavenly Father. And we were pre-existing, and he's the one who helped us get down, you know, into a physical, you know. And instead of saying, I don't believe that, we can say, well, no, let's look at what the Bible says. And then you go through what the Bible says. Let me get to Lowell. Lowell was, oh, I think. God, the way they see it, if God was a man, where did he come from? <laughs> the man. Yeah. Well, he no, no, no. Well, because he came from a family of another god, he was the offspring of another god. He worked himself to exaltation to become a god himself. And when you become a god yourself, you get your own planet. You marry heavenly mother, and you have your own planet. When this is a little bit off, but see, when they go through their temple rites. When you get married in the temple, the, the object is, is that you someday, because of that temple rite or that temple wedding, you will one day become a god. You and your wife will become a god. You will get your own planet. And, and, you, and you can ask them, uh, see, here's the thing with Mormons, because Mormons are brutally honest about what they believe. You know, they don't, they won't say, gee, I know I've got, we've got this thought and it sounds fishy, so I'm not going to say it when I'm talking to people. They may not bring it out, but if you ask them about it, if you ask them, are you hoping to one day be perfect enough to become a God and have your own plans? They'll say, yeah. They'll say, that's my hope. Yeah. The, uh, the Mormons from from Arizona will get Mercury for their planet. <laughs> yeah, really. And they'll be glad that they got get to cool off. <laughs> yeah, so this is so again, this is the thing is to kind of know what you might expect to hear if you run into Mormons, but also um to know to know what the Bible says. So, you know, so that they don't hit you with something that kind of sounds, hmm, I guess that could be, and then you're thrown off, you know, thrown off, thrown off base. And remember, they use the same terminology we use, so it sounds like they're Christian, but they use a different definition of those of those terms. So they have a heavenly father and a heavenly mother, and they also have heavenly children. And then they say, when they're comparing their book to ours, they say, wait a minute, these Lutherans, guess what they believe? They think that <laughs> God's son came down, or a spirit came down and had sex with a woman and created a God. That's right. They, they, could, they could go that far. Uh, you know, he said, I mean, we believe that a man who was once dead is now alive and rules the universe. I mean, everybody's got a little bit of a strange thing if people want to uh, twist it. But again, if you take them to the Bible, because they do say that they believe the Bible, as long as it's properly translated. And so you can take them to the Bible and say, let's see what the Bible says about that. What does the Bible say? Where is the um, Gene? Who said Gene? I did. Yeah. If I had my own planet. I'd run it a lot different than people are running this one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well, and a lot of people think they could do it better than God. Well, they, people do. I didn't say that. No, no, no. I know you. I know you didn't. But um, well, when it says um. You know, something like uh, Isaiah 43.10 on page four 
says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So when you read verses like that, you, what you need to do is you need to internalize those to make sure that you know that you know, you know, that you got your knower full of knowledge on these kinds of things. So that when people say that, you can say, okay, I know that's what you believe, but that's not what the Bible says. And then you show them. And then you have to listen to see how they're going to react. You know, and then you follow up, you know, um, you know, you follow up after that. You know, now they they will do something, not just them. I mean, all these people, yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, they believe that there's one God. They just don't believe that Jesus is part of it. But what people do is they'll take other passages in the Bible, and they'll say, well, look what it says over here. Okay? So to combat that Isaiah 43.10, because what they'll say is, no, no, no. He says that he's the one, but he doesn't mean one in absolute one, you know? There's a plurality of one, you know, it's like one. So they'll go over to Matthew. Where's the Jesus in the garden? 17. They'll go to Matthew 17, where Jesus is praying in the garden. And he says, you know, Lord, he goes, I haven't lost any that you've given me. Like a, and something about, um, uh, you know, let's make them all one, you know, I got now that now you got that plurality of one. Yeah, I know that you want all your people to be one, but they don't understand. Isaiah's written 700 years earlier by a different author for a different reason, but they want to compare them to someone written later who's writing in a different context, who's accounting for a historical event. But a lot of times we fall for that kind of stuff. They go, oh, yeah, I guess it does say there that it's... Um, you know, that one doesn't mean one, you know? But we all know one's the loneliest number, right? How'd that song go? <laughs> yeah, Three Dog Night. All right, so, uh, Lowell. I told you guys before about my Mormon sister and brother-in-law. And uh, just for a point, they're expecting their 27th, 28th, and 29th great-grandkids. Right? But I've never heard... I've never heard my brother-in-law, when he offers prayer, talk about the Holy Mother. He talks about Father. Right. Doesn't even say Heavenly Father. Right. It says Father. Well, well, Holy Father is the God. I don't know if Holy Mother is a God, you know, or if or if she only has God ranking under him because he's the husband, which it which it could be. Yeah, so. So Title Nine doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, you know, so it says um, in Isaiah 46, 9, on the same page there, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now, to us, it makes sense, you know, because we're kind of brought up this way, or we're trained this way. But you got to understand when you're trained to read the words differently, again, they'll get into what does the one mean? They'll get into what does it mean before me, after me? You know, uh, what about you know, that may be here on my planet as God, that no one's before me, which is my planet, but on other venues. They can be so. It's a it's a it's a language, you know. It's a language thing. In First Corinthians eight, down there, and I'll finish with this one. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no other god but one. You take a passage like that, and what does that make their god? In our view, pardon. An idol makes makes them an idol. Their God, their God. I mean, according to that verse, there is an idol. 
Now, I don't know that we want to call our neighbor Mormon an idol worshiper. You know, I mean, <laughs> like that. I, <laughs> well, well, that's that's the part. That I'd say. I think that's as far as you can go. If you're just discussing with me, you say, I just don't think you're a Christian because we have these differences. And again, I don't want anybody to think that Mormons are bad people. You know, that they eat their children or they're going to try to eat our children, <laughs> you know, or stuff like that. It's not like that. We just have a different, we have a big difference. Uh, hey, I wanted, I forgot, I wanted to bring up something. You know, two weeks ago, I think Ray asked, when should we engage people? Okay. And then last week, and then Joe had followed up and said, yeah, you know, when do we? And then last week, I tr kind of addressed it some. And I said, because in First um, First Peter 3.15, it says, always be ready to answer you know, when someone asks you about the hope that you have have within you. And so, and they come to your door, you know, and so it's not like you're approaching them. It's not like, you know, you walking around and go, you look like a Mormon. Are you a Mormon? And you go, yeah, I'm a Mormon. And you go, well, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. You know, that may be a little bit, but if they come to you, then you can engage them and you can tell them why. <laughs> But I was thinking about this afterwards. You know, it says at the beginning of that verse, I was going to do that, and then I don't remember what the beginning of that verse was. Let me hang, give me half a second here. It says to, um, you know, I know it says to sanctify in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me, let me just get to it here. I think this is important because this would go to when you engage anybody. Uh, here, 1 Peter 3, 15. He says, he says here, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. Always, um, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So it says, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. Um, I think it says sanctify in the other versions, but how how do we do that? How do we honor Christ in our hearts? Yeah, I think it's to know the scriptures. I think it's to know who Jesus is and what the Bible says and stuff like that. So, but then the other part was it says so so that they know when they ask, what is the hope that you have in you? How do they know you have any hope? You're just sitting there at a bus stop. How do they know you have any hope? You're talking with your friends. How do they know you have any hope to ask you the question? You know? So that's where, you know, you think, you know, if you walked up to your friends and you say, man, the greatest thing that happened this week was when I went to church on Sunday. Uh, what kind of looks you think you're going to get from people? They're nuts. That's right. That's exactly it. They're going to think you're nuts. They're going to scratch your head. They're going to say to you, "Wait a minute. I don't understand. First of all, I don't understand why you go to church, but you got to tell me why is that the best thing that happened to you all week?" Now they saw the hope that was in you, you know, and then you can talk to them, Roger. Was it the best thing that happened to you last week? Was when you went to church or Absolutely. the place? <laughs> well, I had a neighbor uh, a couple next door to me in the trailer park. They're uh, from Montana. They have since moved out and sold their trailer to someone else. But I invited them to church one Sunday morning or one Saturday. But they were sitting on the porch having drinks. And so I walked over and I asked them if they'd like to come to church Sunday with me. Oh, no, we can't. We're Mormons. I said, what do you mean you're Mormons? Mormons don't drink. <laughs> and, yeah. That's what, well, you know, they call them Jack Mormons. Yeah, they want, Jack, they're talking Jack, 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 Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. <laughs> well, she said, we're Jack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It, you know, because it, it, it's funny. You do, you invite people to church, and it's like you're inviting them to... 
I don't know, just do the most terrible thing in the, you know, in the world. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. A Jeep. Uh, yeah. But you have to look for opportunities. I was going to um, doing exercises in physical therapy, and Gala was there. She said, "Guess what? I just became a Jew." I said, "Guess what? I'm a Lutheran. I'd love to talk to you." Yeah. And let's discuss our religions. Not, I'm not going to try and convert you, and you're not going to convert me. But yeah. let's talk about it. And, and then, then, and then she and twisted. For, then she twisted your hip extra hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and arm. Yeah. <laughs> but we had we had discussions. Not only that, but we were loud enough that other people yeah. that were listening to what we were saying joining the conversation. Yeah. And come to find out there were people there that say, hey, my dad was uh, a pastor and so on and so forth. And they bought, they joined the conversation. And, you know, before we know it, we're talking religion yeah. left and right. So you have to look for opportunity yeah, no, no. I mean, and not be so hesitant good. and good. ask them questions like, here you both, Abraham. My question is, who's Abraham? Yeah. What what book did he write? Did he write a book? Is it part of the Mormon uh, uh, Bible? Yeah. Where is the ad in the Bible? I don't know. Tell me about him. Yeah. No, the book of Abraham's in the red one here. We'll get to it. In fact, if we get down far enough, I'll I have a quote from there. But anyway, so the thing is, so we, you know what? So that people know that we have a hope or that we have something that's worth discussing, like Ray said. I mean, what what is it that we have? You know, we have forgiveness of sin. We get to go to heaven. You know, we've get, been reconciled with God. You know, so people say, why was that the greatest thing that happened to you this week? You know, is I got to hear about Jesus. I got to hear about my God reconciling himself to me, you know, through Jesus Christ, you know, about my path to heaven. And just a, then all of a sudden they know you've got a hope. And then they're going to say, after they call you nuts and after they, you know, Try to get away or whatever. They're gonna they're gonna ask what it is. So that goes back to that question there. I got another one for you too, yeah. if you don't mind. Um, I used to wear a crucifix. I stopped wearing it. I don't know how many years ago. I took it off for whatever reason. Anyway, but I've seen a lot of people on TV now wear the crucifix, and they'll wear it outside their clothing, so it invites conversation. And then when they ask you, what's that? What are you wearing that for? And then you can tell them. It opens up doors. Yeah, no, there's some. Um, you know, pastor always wears his. You always wear yours? Or just at these religious meetings? <laughs> Hudson. Ray, are we talking about crucifix or man with cross? But that might be something too that you might want to invest money in and buy some or hand them out when people join the congregation. Or say, you know, we all like to wear ours and we like to wear it on the outside. The sad, join us. The sad part about that is that a lot of people are just wearing it just for decoration. Right. Nowadays. You see the ball players with the earring with the cross on it, or with the ball players when they cross home plate and they either cross themselves or they point out, you know, I don't know, are they a religious? Yes, sir. What? Oh. Oh, there. Oh, he's got a cross on his belt buckle. <laughs> anyway, so go to page five. Let me see what time this is. Go to page five where it says the pre existence. Um, you know, I've gotten the notes here that uh, pre mortality refers to our life before we were born on this earth. In our pre-earth life, we lived in the presence of our Heavenly Father as His spirit children. We did not have physical bodies, okay? Then this is why your sister has 29 great-grandchildren. And it is why Mormons have a whole bunch of kids. is because they're bringing the, the uh, bodiless spirits down to earth because only 
only embodied spirits in Mormon theology, only embodied spirits can then get the good stuff afterwards. You know, I, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know that anybody really defines what this pre-existence was. You know, we believe that we we weren't around before. You know, I got, you know, we weren't around before that we were created when Mama and Papa did the deed. And that was that was our that that was our creation, okay. okay. But Mormons believe that the, these spirits are being plucked out of heaven, brought to earth through birth, for the good for the good purpose. And so, uh, do they have dysfunctional families in Mormonism? Well, I'm sure they do. I have a dysfunctional family. I'm the CEO of a dysfunctional family, you know? And so we're all of you, so I don't want to hear about it. You know, like that. Yeah. I was just wondering about so, that. Uh, Gene, I like to say, it's one of those things that they talk about, you know, but they don't have details on it. Because how, would you have, how would you have details on it? You know, like so when Joseph Smith started this thing and he found his golden tablets, and he got a bunch of people together, did he espouse all this stuff right up the beginning, or did it, did he just have I'm sure revelations that well, come later? You know what? I don't know. You know, you got to remember. See, like the uh, doctrines and covenant and the pearl of great price and the and the Book of Mormon. Got to remember in the beginning, all this stuff's being revealed to him. You know, whether he's getting it from the. Egyptian golden plates, or whether he's getting it from the revelation of Mormon. What's that? Well, they got they got buried, you know, like that. And you know, I mean, there's a whole history behind it. You know, I, th I think we said last week. I think it was last week where we said that the Book of Mormon is the story of Jesus Christ coming over during the time of Jeremiah, and. Um, or no, the, the, there was a group of people who left Israel, came over to the Americas, and then Jesus revealed himself to them and had those golden plates, and then they got Moroni or whoever buried them, and then they were buried for all those years, you know, 1,500 years, 2,000 years, whatever it is, and then it was revealed to Joseph Smith, and that's where, you know, he dug them up or they were presented to him. I don't remember right now. And then he, um, uh, and then, and other witnesses saw him with the plates and then whether Moroni took them back or I, I don't, I just don't, I just don't remember. You know, and most of them don't, most Mormons probably don't know for sure. Either. But they, again, you can only go so far because, you know, and we do that. You know, we do that with our scriptures. You know, there's things that we read, and all we can do is say, amen, I don't understand it. I read it. I accept it because it's in the Bible, but it doesn't give me any more. It doesn't give me any more information than what it what it says. So we're stuck like they are on, you know, things like that. Right. No, that's the thing. Where's the Ark of the Covenant today? Uh, besides in that warehouse in Washington, D.C., you know, but, you know, we don't know, but we still say there was a Ten Commandments, and we say that God wrote on the Ten Commandments with his very own finger, you know, so, I mean, we've got, you know, that kind of stuff, too. Yeah, why don't you do the microphone? No, do they have a second coming? Yeah, yeah. I, I, let me let me finish where I'm going with this stuff, and you know, and that's okay. Here, just so you can, just so you can use that. Okay. Anyway, yeah, because you know, if, if anybody's got questions after we finish up, you just call me or send me an email or something like that. Anyway, so in the next point there under the pre-existence says, in this pre-mortal existence, we attended this thing. We attended a council with Heavenly Father's other spirit children, okay? So say we're, we're Heavenly Father's spirit children. This group here, we're meeting in this pre-mortal, um, you know, council here. At that council, Heavenly Father presented his great plan of happiness. 
okay, which is in the book of Abraham, 322 to 26. Henceforth, I have it. I saw it. I'll get it. I'll get it. So in Abraham 3, 22, going to what I said, 26, he says, Now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences. Um, I'd have to look up the definition I had it. They're the enlightened ones, the intelligences, um, that were organized before the world was. And among all these, there were many of the noble and the great ones. And God saw these souls, that they were good, and he stood in the midst of them, and he said, These I will make my rulers, for he stood among those who were spirits. And he saw that they were uh, that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of these men, um, one of them. Thou uh, thou was chosen uh, before thou wast born. That's that old English that God spoke to Joseph Smith in the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and and there were and there um, and there stood one among them that was like unto God, and he said unto those who were with him, "We will go down for um, we will go down for there is space there, and we will take these materials, and we will make the earth." Hang on. <clears throat> And we will, um, and we will make the earth whereupon these may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And they who kept who keep their first estate shall be added upon, and they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom with those who keep with their first estate. And they who keep their second estate shall have the glory added upon their heads. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? Now here's the big thing, okay? So you got this council of all these premortal souls, and God's giving the plan, giving it to like Abraham, because this is in the book of Abraham. He's giving it to Abraham, and all these people are saying, Okay, we'll go down, we'll build the earth, and you know, we're gonna we're gonna do that. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And one answered like unto the Son of Man, Here am I, send me. This is Jesus, just in case you don't know. Okay? Here am I, send me. And another answered and said, Here am I, send me. That's the devil. Okay? And the Lord said, I will send the first. That's Jesus. Okay? And the second was angry and kept not his first estate. And at that day, many followed after him. Demons. I got it. Anyway, so that's, um, so, but that's, that's what's happening up in this pre-mortal, you know, in this pre-mortal state, you know. Um, what can I say? Is there a copyright date to that? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> This is, um, it's part of the uh, Doctrines and Covenant and the Pearl of Great Price are two writings of the Mormon Church, official writings, just as official as the Book of Mormon, okay? And so, and th this is um, in the Doctrines and Covenant part. So is the Book of Abraham in the Book of Mormon? Right. Okay. Uh, no, the Book of Abraham is in the Doctrines and Covenants. Okay. Don't ask me. And that's the only place the book of Abraham is in the Mormon Bible. No? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it's the only one we know of. Roger. Earlier, you spoke of the angel Moroni. And then, as you read from the book of Abraham, you talked about the intelligences. Yeah. Okay. And the uh, translated with the. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I, can, I can do better than that. I do, they. Um, they're really good. They've got. My point is, if you take the eye off Moroni 
You have a moron. That's what, that's what you got out of the intelligences, huh? Uh, here. They, you know what? They have an index and concordance in here. So let's see. Intel here, the intelligence. Um, the intelligence. Here's the definition. It says cleaveth onto intelligence. Oh, it just tells me all the different places. That's the concordance part. Anyway, so again, it's not to it's not to denigrate Mormons. That's what we gotta remember. So when they come and they talk about the pre-existence, we have to be able to tell them what the Bible says. You know, and the Bible says, you know, there's a couple of places. I mean, I know David talks about how God created him in the womb. I think it's in Psalm 51 or Psalm 139. It's one of those, you know, where he talks about how God created him in his mother's womb. And it wasn't like, you know, there was anything. You don't ever read anything, you know, before that. Um. Let's see. I've got here the next one was the planet, the star of Kolob. You know, <laughs> well, most of the stories that you hear is that God lives on this planet of Kolob, and that's not what the, that's not what it is, and it's hardly mentioned in their scriptures. What it's supposed to be is the closest planet to the place where God dwells. You know, but you hear a lot about, you know, you know, you, I did when I was younger. I mean, heard a lot about the planet Kalob, and but it's not really that big of a, it didn't you know, the way. we know that we know that planet Krypton is the important <laughs> one out there, right? Or yeah. Superman, where Superman dwelleth when he, he was be younger, before it, blew up. before it blew up. Yeah, I got so. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know what? Let me see. Uh, you know, maybe we'll do this again next week, only because next week we're going to have the business meeting, so it's going to be short anyway. So we'll finish up then. Is that okay with everybody? I got, I mean, and then we'll get back to Revelation after after that. Uh, hang on. Does anybody online have anything? Uh, okay. Uh, Pastor Callio. Give me your microphone. Yeah. Hear all this. I always remember our professor at the seminary before we left. He said, Watch it, fellas, lest you fall into the abyss of human subjectivism. And there's all these human traditions and you know, and so forth. It's exactly what he talked about. Yeah, yeah. human subjectivism. Yeah, that's what you know. That's why you know, when people come up with anything that sounds odd, chances are it's because it is odd. It's just, a, especially if they're doing it in a Christian sense, is just say, can you show me that in the Bible? Can you show it to me in the Bible? You show it to me in the Bible, we can discuss it. Because they may come up with, you know, people take all kinds of verses and wording out of context like that. And so you have to go, show it to me, and then we'll discuss it. But if they if they can't do it, then you know it's just something that they've heard. You know, just something that they've heard and they've never had to really deal with it. Yeah. It sounds almost like the shades of Nimrod. The who's? Nimrod. What about the shades? The shades, I mean, in the shadow, okay, of Nimrod in the fact that Nimrod was trying to build a tower, a Babel, and up to heaven. And God said, look at what they're building. Yeah. Idiots. Let's go and confuse yeah. their languages. Let them speak Mormon. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, but it's it, but it, but it's like what I, you know, it's like what I was saying to Roger is that uh, there's an innumerable amount of people who think that they can do it better than God, and the only way that they know the way God did it was way way the Bible says it, and they said, well, you know, I think what he really meant, or I think that we'll see when God was talking to man, man misunderstood what he said, and they wrote down the wrong thing. You know, and what are you gonna what are you gonna do? But we've got to be ready for the challenges too, because when people say no, this is what the Bible means, or this is what this passage means, or this is why 
the Trinity is not true. We'll do the Trinity next week. But this is why the Trinity is not true. Number one reason why they give for the Trinity not being true. What is it? You've all heard it. Trinity is not in the Bible. You know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. You know, so I, you know, so you have to know how to answer. You know, you ha need to know how to answer that. So we're in the same boat, you know, with them. Yeah, the thing is that Mormons, these, the young Mormon missionaries, they know their Bible back and forth. Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, these little old ladies you see standing on the corner, they know their Bibles backwards and forwards. They've been taught wrong about it, you know. Like and you watch them because I watch people challenge um, uh, in videos, people challenging Jehovah's Witnesses on the other corners because they'll videotape and stuff like that. Mormon. Little old ladies, they pull out their phone. You know, somebody's challenging them or wanting to show them a verse. You know, so they've got their Bible. They pull out their phone. I've watched them. They pull out their phone. They go to the Bible on, you know, on the on the Jehovah's Witness website, and they look it up. They know exactly where to go. You know, and they can you do that? No, I'm serious. I mean, could you do that if you get challenged on something? You know, could you go to the verse that you want to show them? You know, if I said, show me the Trinity in the Bible, could you do it? You know, so that's the challenge that the that the cults offer to us is because they have stuff. They've just been trained wrong. Let me do Andy, do you the little microphone I gave you? All right. All right. I think P.T. Barnum said it properly. He is the guy that did uh, Barnum Brothers and Ringling Brothers Circus. He said, there's a new fool born every second. Yeah, but they would say that's us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing. They would say, they would say that's us. I'm, I'm telling you, these uh, will stick to Mormons right now because that's what we're doing. But, I mean, these Mormons, they're sincere. I believe they're sincerely wrong. But, I mean, but they're sincere. They know their stuff. And most of the time what the answer is on the doorstep when they come is, I've got my own religion, slam the door, instead of saying, wait, let me get my Bible, and we'll stand here and do it. Roger, what were you going to say? Um, the word Trinity may not be in the Bible, but there are proofs of it. And the Bible should be able to put it together. No, 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 I understand that. But what I'm saying what I'm saying is that's the objection. That's People will object and say the Trinity, you know, the Trinity is false. Because and the number one answer is going to be because it doesn't say anything about the Trinity in the, you know, in the um, in the in the Bible. We got to wrap up. So it's were, a matter. You, know, you were reaching. Are you going to say something, Dave? Well, wait. Let, let him, and then I'll, you can reach. Okay. It's a matter of how much you want to invest in it, how much personal time you mm -hmm. have to get into the Bible. Just like what you sent me with those seventy-four presentations. And I got into it. I've gone through 30 of them. And I would encourage anybody that has any hunger for the Bible to contact Gene and have them send them to you. They're only like 20 minute presentations, but he, he was talking to me about um he said, What do Lutherans believe? I don't forget that Tacoma church, you know, what do Lutherans believe versus these guys? You know, so I was trying to explain. I was trying to explain to him, but what I said to him is that Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, they um, they have a um, uh, Joel, Beardman. Joel Beardman has a class on Lutheran doctrines that pre-seminary that <laughs> incoming students have to take the summer before um, you know they start seminary. Did you have to take something like that where you went to? You either test out and then take. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, like that. So that they, what they, so what they do is they teach you the doctrines of the Lutheran Church, and so what they do is every time they, I'm, I think they crammed it into a week, you know. But every time they changed a topic, they made a new video. So there's 74 of the videos arranged topically, you know, like that. So I think, ah, what the hell? I'll send it to, send it to Ray. I've gone through 30 of them, and like I said, I strongly encourage you if you have an interest in the Bible and want to learn what about being Lutheran or being able to bring it up to somebody's attention, I would strongly encourage it. Yeah. Either that or read the Bible. <laughs> yeah. 
Or if you're down to your last straw, just read the Bible. Okay, what were you going to say, Dave? And then we're going to finish. Basically, the Mormons are a, a, a great con because they bring people in and they take care of them. They're groups, and <laughs> that's how they bring them in. Uh, and they, it's a confidence. So they don't care about the scriptures. They care about how they're being treated in this church. So it's, it's their outreach. It's a con. From our point of view, it may be, but I wouldn't call them. I wouldn't call them a con. I mean, you know, yeah, the, the only reason they help people is to con them. Whereas, well, so we're not going to help people because we don't want to con them. You know? <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's a fine it's a fine line. Like I say, they're good people. They just have a different understanding of scripture. And I think I talked about and we'll finish up. I think I talked about this last week is that they've been taught that from the beginning. And I use the example. If I started teaching something that was weird, you know, because you guys trust me, you'd probably receive what I had to say. Remember, I stood over here and said, well, the truth is here, but now I'm teaching from here. And then I teach from here. But you don't notice that I'm that far from there because last week I was here you know you just get a little pretty soon you're far away from the truth but all you guys have been taught by me and you trust me that this is the truth and that's where they are i mean it's not like <laughs> it's not like they purposely it's not like they purposely know that it's not true but they hang on you know because people don't people don't do that now the sad part is and i'll finish with this the sad part is if you get people to give up their mormon religion Chances are they're not going to come to us. They're just going to be atheists. They're going to be secular. They're they're not going to go to, you know, they're not going to go to another religion. What you've done you, you, is we've destroyed their hope in God, you know. So now they have no hope in God because we proved that their God's wrong. You got to be careful about that. I mean, you got to be careful about that. It can't be to just destroy their religion. It has to be drawing them into into our religion. So I'm done if everybody else is done. Okay. Um, we have no, we have no song. Anybody online have anything last comment like that? Troy, good to see you. Howard, good to see you. Denny, good to see you. I'm going to turn off the recording. You guys can stay, but I'm turning off the recording part. Oh, oh. were you going to say something, uh, Troy? No. Okay. No, no, no. I know. 